professor of uh, cultural sociology at the campus university uh, Italy uh, but most important I'm a member of uh, a research center on fashion moda cult which is based in Milan at the Università uh, Cattolica um, Isabel first of all I would like to congratulate you and the organizers for your really great work um, because uh, you were able to collect dozens of people dozens of uh, colleagues and fashion scholars despite the pandemic and so I see that the fashion community is uh, alive and this is great uh, news and I am especially glad to see so many colleagues and to listen to so many uh, speeches because my research center had to cancel an international conference last June Fashion Tales 2020 uh, because of the pandemic we are trying to postpone it to 2021 so we are taking great inspiration from uh, uh, GFC so I hope to see you and, and many others uh, uh, next next year in presence or online because we, we are witnessing that it works it, it is great even if not as great as uh, an offline uh, conference having said that a uh, uh, couple of minutes to to comment on this very intense uh, uh, day and I would like to comment briefly the title of uh, GFC conference especially the words past, present, and uh, future, which I also heard uh, used in many talks uh, today. Um, it is clear to all of us that the pandemic has forced us to think of the future even more than uh, before. And the fashion field, uh, I think, has been always characterized by the logic of uh, uh, the speed because it has invented the, the practice of trend forecasting, for example, in an effort to predict the future patterns of consumption. It also has uh, widely used uh, the past, the heritage, as an asset to build uh, the future of the brands. And now I think we are facing two main uh, challenges related to the past and the future. First, uh, we must avoid the trap of dreaming of a future as a return to uh, the past. And second, the, the, the trap of transforming the changes that we are experiencing in these days, in this emergency, into kind of routine for our future lives. I think this applies to both the passion field and our lives as academics and uh, individuals and so I just want to thank all the speakers of this conference today uh, because their contribution is precious to us uh, as to understand how to face the future benefiting from the past but without getting trapped uh, in it so this is what I just want to say a big thank you for all the very rich speeches I have been listening to today. And that's all. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. And as Marco Padroni said, this is really an incredible feat and congratulations for, for those of us. I also plan a conference um, in pursuit of luxury is the name of the conference and it was in milan we had to cancel it in may and reschedule and it's it's really we those of us who plan understand how much and those of us who attend conferences how complex it is to put together such a rich program of so many speakers from academia from industry and to really do it in a seamless way which you've done on the first day so i am a sociologist i teach at brooklyn college in the school of business and I'm going to talk just a bit about some reflections from this, this first day. So the conference presents us with a wealth of knowledge over three days, providing insight into scientific research that many attendees might not otherwise have known about. And as fascinating as the research within the broad field of fashion studies is, we do know, like in all academic research, that the typical article is only read maybe by four people. And those are our colleagues and maybe a close person to us, not oftentimes it doesn't isn't disseminated widely enough. And I think that's a real barrier in scientific research. And that's something that this conference addresses. It really provides access to um, attendees 
to experts who are in the museum world, important organizations such as the Fédération de la Haute Couture et de la Mode, and those who work in the fashion industry in a variety of roles. We felt when we were sitting, we felt that we were sitting across from Xavier uh, Le Pendle at his desk at Hermes and really gave us that sensation and some, a place that we wouldn't have access to otherwise for most of us. And when he spoke about how knowledge is transmitted, how know-how is transmitted and how the firm's commitment to its artisans remains so strong, we really did feel like we were there with him. And I think it was the same in the parallel sessions. You know, we weren't together, but yet we had this sense of real connection. And for academics, there is this great divide between those who study fashion and between practitioners who work in the industry. And I think the Global Fashion Conference plays a pivotal role in, bridge, in bridging that gap and in creating a chance for a real dialogue to take place, which again is something that doesn't often happen between these two segments. And as with many good conferences, we, which have excellent programs, it's impossible for us to be everywhere. We wish we could split ourselves into two so that we could have attended all the parallel sessions. Um, I went in and out of some sessions and I'm just gonna give you a few of my impressions. So the first sessions covered four areas ranging from the very micro level, dealing with emotion, for example, to the very macro level. So in that, uh, we dealt with communications, influencers, makers, and there was even a workshop on sustainability. In the communication session, Britta Kalruder and colleagues dealt with the important issue of how COVID-19 has impacted India's craft sector, helping them to create new digital branding strategies to move forward as empowered entrepreneurs. And then Lula Kia, who runs the firm Style Innovators, took us right into women's closets and explained how she's contributing one wardrobe at a time to sustainability and to a change of consciousness. The second set of parallel sessions dealt with narrative, knowledge, sustainability, consumers and demand, collaboration and co-creation. In the many presentations that dealt with sustainability, one question that emerges is how can one encounter the, domi the dominant narrative and marketing practices or how can one counter the dominant, dominant narrative and counter um, and marketing practices which call for an increased consumption and speed when this type of engagement in the fashion world is very enjoyable for people. It's seductive, it's compelling, and we saw examples um, of what companies to do to draw in consumers. Elaine Rich projected a campaign by The Style where glamorous new collections are produced every two weeks and at a very low cost. So again, we can imagine how many of us who are, who are academics who teach, how compelling it is for our students. And then when we talk about sustainability, uh, very somber, oftentimes in comparison. And then on the other side of the spectrum, right, we have various calls to action and challenges that ask consumers to rethink their practices. The UN's Act Now Fashion Challenge uh, lacked this kind of pathway for how we could bring about change. And so Emma Kidd and researchers that she's working with employed a new method in their fashion detox challenge where they asked customers to ask people to embrace voluntary simplicity and really did work to attain a change of consciousness. Another important conversation that emerged had to do with the fact that there's a disconnect between companies and designers and their platforms for sustainability and the internal practices within companies. And there's also a disconnect between companies, between designers and the people that they're designing for. And certainly there is a divide we, can, we know between academics. There are many people working in different disciplines who are doing research on fashion. They don't sh share the same research methods. There's a, a different vocabulary. So this came up in many of the presentations and conversations. So there really is a need for greater transparency on the part of companies and more exchange between academics and also, of course, between academics and industry. Influencers were another major theme and not only influencers that we are all familiar with, the celebrity influencer, but 50 plus influencers, for example, that were discussed by Jennifer Ann Brown. There, are, there were discussions on how there's a need for influencers to provide models for sustainable practices and also for influencers to advance the needs of consumer segments that have been ignored. For example, the visually impaired consumer and uh, Liliana Pina addressed this issue. So where is fashion headed in the future? In a brave new world where retail and many fashion brands and indeed 
uh, those who work for them have been devastated by COVID-19. We have to come to terms with a landscape that had been for a long time changing and had issues that needed to be addressed. New avenues must be explored. Crisis often provides the possibility for innovation and new ways of thinking, even for a change of consciousness. Louise Ravlock spoke of innovative ways that she, as a designer, empowers her customers, and she calls for designers to engage in a collaborative process with customers. This is a goal of the conference, addressing the past, present, and future of fashion, forging new connections, finding solutions, and creating pathways for growth and change. And one of the things that I wanted to suggest, because I think there's just such a wealth of information and a real treasure trove, and what I think we should do for the next conference is that we should have a library of every video that was presented, every presentation that was presented, and it would be an invaluable teaching resource and an opportunity really to create a database that um, can be there for people to draw upon because it's really fascinating and we really need to preserve and archive all of this wonderful research and all of these conversations and interventions that are happening at the conference.